Hi, I'm Daniel Zangle with PRP Labs, joined by Don Lipscomb, and we're going to be talking about how to activate PRP. And uh, activating PRP is basically once you're done drawing the blood, centrifuging it, extracting out your platelet-rich plasma, uh, you can do another step before injecting the, the PRP, uh, which is activating it. And that is um, a process that Don can probably best explain. Uh, so Don, what does that mean to activate PRP? So basically you're just getting the platelets to start secreting their growth factors. Okay. Which remember you added an anticoagulant at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that made them shut down and you're basically telling them, okay, start back up. Right, yeah. okay. And, and so when you're activating the PRP, it's gonna produce more growth factors. Um, and, and does this also cause it to clot, it, like the, yes, the it, fibrin production it does, as well? Yes, it does cause the clotting cascade. However, um, you're, you've already centrifuged it and separated out the different components, so that's not going to be quite such an issue now because the red blood cells are gone and everything. Okay, got so it. that's um, like later on down the line that will occur potentially, mm -hmm. but there's also quite a degree of separation that's already gone on. So Got it. So it could it could begin forming this like gel solution, uh -huh. but it depends on what you're using too. Like, and the sure. study that I'm going to discuss actually uses something called thrombin, which um, that will actually uh, introduce uh, the fibrin to form those long strands. Okay, so thrombin is one of the ways to activate PRP. Exactly. Um, so uh, the study that I want to discuss today actually used four different types of um, uh, clotting factors. Uh, so these were 10% calcium chloride, which we've seen in previous research, this has been used a lot, but maybe not so much in the field. Yeah, yeah, I'll get to that. 10% um, uh, autologous thrombin, not from, not bovine thrombin though, because that's, there are lots of risks associated with that. And also you can develop a horrible immune reaction for right. another. Um, and a mixture of autologous thrombin and calcium chloride at 10% concentration. And finally, 10% uh, collagen type one. So the reason for the collagen type one is that this acts sort of as, as a control without the addition of like calcium chloride or thrombin, one of these proven um, clotting factors, because some physicians will inject PRP um, into the injured site. And so they rely on the presence of uh, the body's own collagen uh, at the site of injury to actually activate the platelets okay. and induce um, this subsequent release of growth factors and inflammatory mediators. So in this study, they're basically using an in vitro setting and trying to replicate exactly. what it might be like in vivo by using that collagen Exactly, spot okay. on. Um, however, as we all know that this <laughs> in vitro Mimicking in vivo is often probably doesn't work. Quite no, as but this expect. is a good. This is this is just a really good test of all of the different um, uh, clotting factors or activators, if you will, that could be used. Um, so the results overall. So collagen was found to be the least effective in terms of platelet um, uh, release of growth factors. Um, so it had the lowest level of these growth factors released okay. compared to the other three. Um, uh, in terms of kinetics, so release rates, how mm -hmm. quickly the growth factors were released. So calcium chloride two alone actually showed a gradual release of growth factors uh -huh. over time with a low initial level. Um, however, at 24 hours, um, it was uh, higher than actually some of the other um, activators. And it also continued to maintain this steady rate of release longer. Got it. So um, additionally, it was found that the thrombin and calcium chloride um, formed a clot within 15 minutes, actually. Okay. So it was actually getting this fibrin, you know, sort of activated and forming sure. this like gelatinous gel solution. Sure, so it happens much faster with the thrombin. Exactly, much faster. Um, and calcium chloride too alone began to clot after 30 minutes. And collagen just failed to clot at all after okay. 24 hours. Got it. Um, so depending on the choice of activating compound, um, when the other factors were normalized, like platelet count and mm. um, white and red blood cell count and everything right. was. Um, so what, what type of injury you're treating, um, a low concentration of growth factors might not be so good. However, an extremely high concentration 
um, delivered immediately yeah. might actually have an inhibitory effect right. on certain cellular functions. Yeah, and, and that's interesting that you bring that up because a lot of clinicians out in the field, they're not activating their PRP mm -hmm. before they do an injection. So like good example would be like a uh, PRP injection for knee osteoarthritis. You pretty much never see a provider actually activate the PRP yeah. that they've prepared um, and, and I'm sure there's reasons for that, but I, I generally see when they're activating PRP and, and causing this sort of gel to form mm -hmm. or, or some sort of clotting, it's often used in uh, surgical procedures, especially uh, oral surgery, especially yeah. uh, like a, a molar extraction or something. They don't want to just have a liquid PRP that'll exactly. just kind of like squirt disease, around and you yeah. drink, it probably doesn't taste good, you know? So uh, that's why they activate the PRP and really, they're essentially producing platelet-rich fibrin at that mm -hmm. point, or maybe somewhere in between. Yeah, they're forming a clot already in there, so that the clot can then, um, you know, other cells can stick to it and begin the healing process. Right. Versus, and you bring up a really good point, so for osteoarthritis, you would want something like a liquid. So then the liquid would go into the closed joint cavity, mm -hmm. so it couldn't really escape. Right. And then, before we, we were filming this, you're mentioning that sometimes you want somewhere in between, right? Exactly. So we, we want like the gelled PRP, almost like a PRF for like a, a molar extraction, right? To kind of seal that up. We want the totally liquid PRP that's not been activated for a knee injection. And then it sounds like sometimes you want something kind of in somewhere between. Somewhere in between, yeah. So for instance, um, tendinopathies. Mm -hmm. So in the tendon space, there's a, it's a space of really high pressure. So whenever you're like bending, bending your um, heel, for right. instance, then that pressure is, that's exerted, it's going to force the fluid from right. the neighboring area. So what you'd want to do is use something just hypothetically, like calcium chloride, that would um, initiate this clotting process a little later. Mm -hmm. So it would still be a liquid solution. And then you inject that yeah. into uh, the site of the tendinopathy. And then um, that it would theoretically form a gel uh -huh. that would uh, concentrate all the growth factors right. in that area without them dispersing, but it still would be able to get into the tendon and diffuse throughout yeah. and then just form that um, like biologically <laughs> wonderful net <laughs> right, right. that we'd want in a healing process. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's that's an interesting concept because as, as a clinician, you're kind of playing with time, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have your PRP and add the calcium chloride, you mentioned in the study, within 30 minutes, it's formed a gel. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you're not gonna wanna inject a gel into no. a patient, okay? Or you probably can't. Um, however, you wouldn't wanna just inject the PRP fluid for a, a tendinopathy if there's a lot of stolic pressure because it might mm -hmm. just disperse. So you wanna kinda time it. So you're injecting an activated PRP that's still a liquid with the hopes that it will quickly gel once exactly. it's been in, injected. That's, That's the idea. I mean, you want like the Goldilocks PRP, right? Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just right. Yeah. So. Yeah. It'd be interesting. I don't think I've seen anything like this, but if they did a study with PRP that's been activated with calcium chloride mm -hmm. and then timed it differently, like we did the injection five minutes after we added the activator, 10 minutes, 15 minutes hmm. to that see. That would be an interesting study. Yeah. yeah. There might be something. Maybe. Just have to look. Maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll do a video about it if we find one. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I find that a lot of uh, providers aren't activating the PRP. I think for, for some clinicians, it's an extra step, takes extra time. Um, and then I think for a lot of indications, it doesn't make sense. But it seems like there are certain... If it's certain superficial or, or um, I mean, sorry, if it's for osteoarthritis in right. particular, that's not going to, that's not going right. to be as effective. Right, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So that's uh, our video on activating PRP. I think we're going to be signing off for the day, uh, but hopefully next week we'll be coming back with some more science about uh, platelet-rich plasma.